and that's why he's got the beard. Most nice thing the press have ever done. I was really happy to find out this is where we were coming. I said, I'm in. The festival of the people who live here. That was amazing. Our moderator for this session is Henri Behar, and it is now my pleasure to welcome Rafe Fines and Felicity Jones for The Invisible Woman. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the press conference for The Invisible Woman uh, with us today. Uh, not so long ago, she was uh, named Breakthrough Actor of the Year. She certainly broke through Miss Felicity Jones as Nelly. City I'm going to clap. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. <laughs> Thank you. Sitting next to her as Charles Dickens, but also as the director, Mr. Ray Fiennes. <laughs> and I guess I'll throw the first question in your direction, Mr. Mr. Fines, you mean to come in, jump in whenever you want, Ms. Joe. Mm -hmm. um, Colour me ignorant, but very few of us, certainly me in particular, uh, had no idea that this woman existed mm -hmm. in Charles Dickens' life. Uh, how did she emerge? Who ferreted her out? Mm. And how did she come your way? Well, it's really interesting that still, in fact, although th her life and her involvement with Dickens has been quite well documented, that still the, the, the great effort that Dickens himself went to and Ellen Turner to keep their relationship secret, that we still feel the, the reverberations of, of, of that secret today. Um, this film is based on a, a book by an English biographer, Claire Tomalin, who went to great lengths to really write about N Nellie specifically, and then uh, Dickens as, as, a, as a leading player in, in Ellen's life. Um, I first came across this as a screenplay by Abby Morgan in relatively early stages, and became fascinated by this story. I was relatively ignorant of Dickens himself and of, and of this, this love affair. But I think what drew me to it was the idea that, because Ellen went on to, to lead a life after Dickens' death, she married again, and the idea that someone uh, keeps within themselves the history, the, the markings of an of a, of a intimate relationship which, which they keep secret. And that was what moved me to, to make it. So you got it as at the script stage? Yes, it was an uh, early-ish draft I got, and then I worked very closely with Abby Morgan to take it. In the film that we have is very, very different from the film script that I first read. Question here to Mr. Kirkland. Um, good day, uh, Bruce Kirkland from the uh, Toronto Sun Sun Media. Uh, and this leads out of what Henri just asked you, uh, but it's a question for both of you. Uh, in today's day and age, TMZ and the uh, scandal sheets and everything else would have, you know, popped this up within 24 hours of the affair uh, percolating through the community. In other words, today is instant. Mm. Here's a hundred year plus gestation of it. And I'm curious now that you're tackling it in a film form, does that make either of you reassess and reread Dickens in, with a new light? Is it illuminate the kind of material that he created as his literary legacy. I'm going to let you go first. Um, absolutely. I, I feel it highlights the, the difference between Dickens as the public man and, and the private man, and those people were very different. And, um, and the film is about it, partly exploring that, that Dickens was, he was very much a modern man in that sense that he created his own brand. And, um, and the brand was one of the family man, the, the, the conservative, and it, it was very um, difficult for his idea of himself that he fell in love with this much younger woman who, um, who wasn't part of that idea of himself that he wanted presenting to the world. Yes, I think what's really interesting when in, in learning about this love affair, and, and fun, funnily enough, I was acting in Great Expectations at the, 
uh, just as I was about to start prepping the film. And Great Expectations was written when we know that he was involved with, with Ellen Turnan. And we, both Felicity and I, had uh, a lot of conversations about, you know, the degree to which Estella might be uh, inspired by, by Nelly. And I think in, and also in Our Mutual Friend, which he wrote also when he was involved with Nelly, I've, it's very interesting to interpret the way he portrays the women in these books. Because I think the, you can identify possibly elements of Nelly in these characters. And, and Felicity, very, you're very uh, uh, specific about the, the, the qualities of Nelly's persona in relation to Estella. Well, absolutely. I actually feel like his female characters get much better after his affair with Nelly. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like um, uh, you can feel her influence in, in his work. Um, I, 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 it was so Im important for us to to capture the the truth of their relationship and it and it was a very it was a very complicated re relationship for both of them and um and and trying to keep this this precious connection private was um was a constant negotiation for I them think both. it was I think it was a difficult it was difficult for both of them difficult for Dickens to to come to terms with what he was doing in leaving his wife and I think he was in denial about the level of cruelty, possibly. He also was passionate about Nellie, and also it was difficult for Nellie to, how did she come to accept to, to be the mistress of Dickens? And I think what I've tried to do with Abby is to, and Felicity, of course, is to chart the journey of Nellie to agreeing to, to, agreeing to being Dickens's quote, mistress. But I think you can see in some of these books this. Dickens was a man of great, he was uh, tormented. He had huge extremes of emotion within him. And I think what we, we tend to receive is the sort of the Christmas card Dickens, the smiling, jolly family, fam, the father figure entertaining the family. And I think when you, when you read about Dickens, and especially in these later novels, you can identify this very, this very disturbed and a, a man in anguish. Yes, go ahead. Okay, Fabian Winter for Latin America. I have two questions for Ralph. Uh, first one is, how do you re direct your own scenes without feeling, as an actor, the invisible man? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, what uh, Ralph Fiennes, the director, thinks of Ralph Fiennes, the actor, and what Ralph Fiennes... Nothing but the best, I'm and, sure. And what Ralph Fiennes, the actor, thinks about Ralph Fiennes, the director? Well, the first... Uh, the answer to your, your first, first part of your question is I have around me uh, a great team of people who are uh, a wonderful woman called Joan Washington who worked with me on Coriolanus who's there uh, well, principally to, to guide me in, in the truth of my own performance and to give me very honest and uncensored critical feedback which she's very good at. Also, I have a great script supervisor, Susanna Lenton, who also worked with me on Coriolana. So these two women, and Gabby Tana, who produced the film, I have a trio of, I suppose you might call them invisible women, be behind the camera, who have, except to me, they're not at all invisible. They're very, very important. Um, but they, gu they, ga they gave me very, very good critical feedback about my own, by my own performance. But uh, Rafe finds the actors very difficult. He's very moody. Uh, tempestuous, storms off the set, <laughs> and um, I think Ray finds the director is also very difficult and uh, <laughs> fractious. And uh, but I can't really comment about that. Maybe uh, Felicity uh, can it say did, it. That. Did feel at points that um, I was being directed by Charles Dickens uh, <laughs> rather than Ray Fiennes at times, <laughs> which was no problem. Um, you you said earlier, Mr. Fiennes, that you had worked uh, very early on at the in the script writing stage, which as a director is fine. Uh, as an actor, that's pretty rare. Mm. So could you, if possible, mm. get into what an actor can bring so early in the writing of a script? And does the opportunity ever come an actor's way? Um, well, what is, what is great is that I... Um, I suppose as an actor, I can attempt to read the dialogue with the writer, Abby Morgan, and start to play out the scenes and to test and to sort of feel whether, of course, this is all in the end, I suppose, my own taste in, and judgment, but at least I can practice the lines and feel with Abby where the scene is going. And um, Abby, I have to say, Abby Morgan was an amazingly generous and collaborative writer. I think lots of writers would not like to sit and have their <laughs> dialogue, as it were, workshopped 
by a director slash actor, but she really was open to to that and. Uh, I think as an actor, sometimes a direct, sometimes directors will embrace very much uh, uh, a method whereby they bring the actors in to do to do exactly this, to to let the actors improvise around and give the actors the the platform to suggest to suggest changes in the writing or to let things emerge. Um, but I remember walking up and down my kitchen, playing these scenes with Abby and t testing them, and then of course the next stage was to to share them with Felicity and the other actors and to see to see how they would grow. So did you, did you add or change a certain number of things in the script that you were given to make it work? I, yeah, I, I feel like, um, and Abby was totally collaborative in this, that you, the more you immerse yourself in a character, the more you want to find the right words for that character. And, and I think that the dialogue has to be an ongoing um, developing process and, and even sometimes on the day when you're when you're shooting it it can change again yeah. question over there then here who has the mic over there yes go ahead Mila Konev Mix TV a question for Rafe um, what challenges did you face uh, to play double duty and you know what you expect from yourself as an actor what do you expect from the actors who worked with you well, I think the big, one of the biggest challenges was, is having decided that I wanted to attempt to tell this story was that it was clearly going to have to be uh, set in Victorian times. And of course, we, we, you know, we, receive, we have received so many, not adaptations of Dickens, but other Victorian dramas. And so how to get inside and through and beyond the requisite design dresses, the look, the decor, um, and so I, I, d I think I felt that the, the way into it, and this was the challenge, was to feel the interior life of the, uh, all the characters, the relationship between the sisters, the, the interior life of M Catherine Dickens, who I think really is fully inhabited by Joanna Scanlon, who gives a brilliant performance as Dickens' wife, uh, even my friend Wilkie Collins. All these people are living, breathing, thinking, you know, eating, sweating people leading a life and um, I think t to try with the actors and asking of course the same of myself to to really keep saying how do we get inside the the interior life of these people and keep and to keep pushing that as much as I could and I do feel when I look at certainly this extraordinary performance that Felicity gives that she she exemplifies what I'm talking about because she inhabits uh, this this woman so brilliantly and yes she has all these corsets and stuff which I mean, the scene which I really moved me profoundly on the day when we shot it was the scene at the end where she talks, she opens perhaps for the first time to this, this priest in the, grave, in the church graveyard and uh, Felicity did something extraordinary on that day. Um, I don't want to embarrass you, but it was, it was very, it was profoundly moving to witness an actor just fur dropping further and further into their role, into the, and the memory, this is a woman remembering, and the way, and you can see it in her face, how she, these memories come flooding back in waves, and the struggle to articulate what these memories meant, and, and that's when I feel I go through, and I watch the film, and of course I'm, it's highly subjective to me, but when I've, I've seen the film many, many times, and every time I come to this scene, it's where I feel in principle, this we go beyond the time, beyond the period, to the vulnerability of a woman talking about something that's been extremely hard for her. Question over there, then uh, here, then here. I have a question for for Rafe. Um, you were here two years ago with your directorial debut, Corey Lanus. I'd like to ask you about the importance of the Toronto Film Festival in bringing attention to a film in what becomes a very busy uh, season mm. in a very busy marketplace in terms of film? Well, I've, I've come to this festival many times. I love it. I always feel that there's a, an extraordinary energy in the air and excitement about all the films. I mean, there's no question it's, it's a big festival. There are many, many, many films. You can feel that after us, there'll be someone else in here. And, but I think it's alive with the excitement and the hunger for filmmaking. And I think you know, I mean, I believe in the act of the cinema, that people in a room and a big screen, and I think festivals are really important benchmarks and punctuations for keeping the act of cinema going alive. 
And this festival, I think above all festivals, it, you feel the people of Toronto, and maybe from even further afield, and of course the filmmakers, but they come in and they, they recharge, they regenerate the, the excitement about the act of film going, leaving your house, leaving your computer screen, and going to sit in a darkened room and watch, watch a, a, a big screen. And you can feel the excitement of that in, in the air as, you, as literally as you're on the streets here during the festival time. Your first time here, Ms. Jones? Sorry? Your first time here? Uh, it's actually my second time. Um, but oh, do you still like us? Um, just about. No, uh, yeah, no, very, very, very much. It's, I actually um, I, I love watching films at festivals because you have no... It's so hard now to go and see a film without loads of preconceptions. So it's so nice to see something when it's completely fresh for the audience. And the audiences here are always so... Um, full of joy for, for, the, for the filmmaking and the films they're watching. Question here, Wh whoever has the mic. Go ahead, hello. then the lady here. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes, um, hello, I'm Swati Sharan from Minority Review, which is a publication from India. And I wanted to ask you, uh, do you guys have pr plans of promoting this film in non-English speaking countries like India? Well, I hope someone puts a plan in place because I would love to come to India to yeah, promote definitely. the film. So uh, whoever's out there that might be dis distributing the film in India, please invite us because it would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Question here, then the lady here, then the gentleman over there. Uh, Hannah Jacobi, Fajr Magazine. Um, costumes are a very integral part and a very important part of period cinema. What was your favorite costume and why? You're asking both, both of, of you. us, um, Well, Michael O'Connor, who did the costumes, is an absolute genius. He, um, he, uh, so at points, he, you know, he understands the characters as, as well as we do. And you, you may say something, you know, like, I feel, you know, she'll have moved her arms a lot in this costume. It would be great if, if there could be creases along their elbows. And then he'll, he'll come back and he'll have taken it even further so that the costumes feel like they've been lived in. Um, and he, well, you didn't ask that. You asked what, what's my uh, what's my favourite costume. Um, gosh, it's hard to kind of just take one out of all of them. I, I mean, I loved the the simplicity of that Michael brought to Nelly's costumes. That it was about um, showing her. There, there's a there's an absolute purity to her, and. Um, it was important that the, the costumes showed that. Well, I can't tell you about one, I can tell you about three different pieces of costume that I really loved. Uh, one was actually a really, it was a genuine period waistcoat. It was actually from the time. And it had, and it's what I wear in the scene, the after party early on when we end up by the window at the beginning of the film. And it's a black waistcoat with beautifully embroidered little grapes and vine leaves on the lapel. And the embroidery and the detail is stunning. And I also loved a dark, very dark blue frock coat that he made, and I lo loved the fabric of this. I thought it was a beautiful color. And I had trouble getting to like, but in the end liking, this huge bow tie that I wore in the, for the charity event. And it was like this, it's right out here. And I kept on saying, surely that's too much, it's too much, it's too much. And Michael kept saying, no, it's Dickens, and look at the pictures. And of course, they were <laughs> these huge things that stuck out to here. So in the end, I, I embraced it. <laughs> Ma'am. Um, hello, it's uh, Daphne Lockyer from the Sunday Telegraph. Um, for us, for the UK audience, Dickens is a, a, an absolute icon. And I wonder whether you were very mindful while you were making this of the audience at home and how they might respond to this very human portrait of, of this, this god, really, for us. Uh, yes, it's still interesting that, um, as I was saying earlier, that I still think people uh, have the story of Nellie and the way Dickens behaved during this time, which was traumatic for his family and certainly for his wife, it's, it's, not, it's not out there. And even having now, it's feeling the way the film is landing, people are saying, well, like Henri said, you know, yeah, he was not aware of the story. But I, I think it was important not to overly sensationalize it. I wanted, with Abby and with Felicity, to, to find the right balance. I mean, Dickens... So I wasn't, I, I felt I, w I, need to be, I needed to be mindful for myself in a way that I wasn't, um, I was wary of the sort of the quick leap to judgment 
that some people would make, oh, Dickens was a scoundrel, you know, uh, an Irish friend of mine said, oh, he's a bit of a bollocks, wasn't he? <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, well, maybe, but I want, you know, there was a whole, there's a whole spectrum of, of Dickens from, you know, he very loyal to his friends, incredibly generous, devoted to social causes where he really delivered on them, um, wrote these amazing books, and then at home, I think, was possibly a difficult father figure, but I wanted to try and at least, if the film didn't have the space to show all these things in depth, to try and indicate them, to suggest them. Mm. Sir? Uh, oh, hi. sorry, ma'am, ma'am, for who has it? Go. Hi, Go ahead. Chris Michael from The Guardian. Uh, just following on from the last question, I have two uh, things. One is about Claire Tomlin's book. Uh, she doesn't sort of conclusively state that they slept together. And also she talks about the miscarriage in a, a sort of very hazy way. Were you worried at all about going too far with that? And uh, my second question is about, um, uh, I think you've said that you never read Dickens before this. Is that true? And if so, how? No, it's, <laughs> it's true that I was pretty ignorant about Dickens, I'd by way of choice, I suppose. Where, um, I had read Little Dorrit, and I had seen some Dickens films, but I hadn't ever I'd been on an English literature course or at A-level. I'd never been, uh, Dickens had never been prescribed for me, and I had never chosen to really go through the canon of Dickens's work. I think maybe that might have been the plus. I came, I came open, and I read Abby's script, and then Claire's book, and became completely fascinated by him, and then read some of the books that I felt were sort of closer to the time that he was meeting Nellie. But um, I think Claire is very, in her book, to go back to your first point, she's quite, she argues that although there is no absolute proof that she believes there was certainly consummation, and absolutely she believes there was a child, even possibly two, um, and other biographers have, have started to acknowledge that sh this is probably the best bet. There is, the, Peter Aykroyd, English writer, he actually believed there was no consummation, and I don't agree. I think there absolutely was. And they, Dick, she lived in this house, first of all near Windsor and then near Peckham for seven or eight years, and I believe there was a physical relationship between them. But the closest we have to any kind of proof is recorded conversations from Katie Dickens, one of the daughters, and Henry Dickens, that there was a child. And I think an earlier biographer of Dickens met Henry Dickens and he said, yes, there was indeed a child and it died. And a writer called Felix Aylmer also wrote a book much earlier than Claire's where he investigated the, the possibility of there being this illegitimate child. He even posits that the child grew up and was given up for, a, for adoption. So there's enough of a noise around it that I think and I think the film, you know, I, of course, I'm, <laughs> I'm, what am I going to say? I, I think we, we, <laughs> we suggest it re reasonably truthfully. D Claire argues that he, a lot of time was spent in France. That they went to France. A lot of this time is unaccounted for in Dickens' diaries. And she argues that, you know, France was the place people went to in England when they had to deal with um, illegitimate births. And so I've sort of followed the hints and the leads that, that Claire writes, really. Yeah. And interestingly, um, after Dickens had died, Nellie went straight to France, um, which suggests that there was an incredible emotional attachment to that place, I suspect, because of the, the lost child. Now, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a comment, social comment that is made in your film perhaps far more clearly than when you see The Great Expectation, David Lean's Great Expectation, which I saw a couple of days ago, actually. Uh, it's the place of women in the society, in Dickens' society, which you made much clearer and possibly much more political, if my, the French side of me can say that. <laughs> well, I think that, again, uh, Claire's, Claire's book and working with Abby were the sort of signposts for me. I mean, Claire Tomalin describes the lives of these actresses so brilliantly, and I really wanted to try to get the audience to see the challenges for th this family of women, these three sisters and their mother, who are hard pushed economically. A fin financial anxiety is a huge, women were mostly dependent entirely on the earnings of men at this time. Uh, it was very rare for a w woman to be independent. In fact, the theater and one or two actresses, Claire writes about them, were, these, some of these women were financially independent, but it was really rare. So I think this sort of social political 
or, or gender political th area is how you know is 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 Mrs. Turner, the mother, acquiesces and indeed tacitly allows this relationship to happen because she sees a secure future for her daughter. So she's, and, and again I was inspired by Claire's writing about the dilemma of the mother, how she, what's she going to do? She risks a sort of social ostracization possibly for her daughter, but the security and the benefits of support of Dickens perhaps outweigh the risk of breaking the taboo. And these were all very complicated and difficult areas to get into without, of course, getting too preachy about it. But uh, I also wanted to show that, you know, I mean, there's a scene I love, which is these three women unpacking their, their clothes, their, their theatrical clothes together, and they're worrying about the lace wearing down on a sleeve and having to replace it. And also, the, I, I wanted to try and suggest the bond, the bond between these three sisters. Um, and that, I think that was the bond that made them strong in the world, in this difficult world that they, were, they had to survive in, this, and this theatrical world too. I mean, again, sorry to go on, but the theater was a place where women were often, you know, men went to the theater to look at women um, to, as voyeurs, you know. Actresses were considered to be sexually available. And uh, the Turnan family, I think, were trying to, to, trying to keep their respectability very much. And, uh, in a very dif dif difficult arena, and so I, I think there are all these cross currents and tensions um, that that Claire describes, and with Abby, I I tried to suggest in the film. I'm afraid our time is up. Thank you very Sorry, much, I both of you, you, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.